Welcome to the video version of the Guide to Excellence in Treasury. This is an ebook produced by Strategic Treasurer and CTM File. To download the ebook, please go to strategictreasurer.com/guide. Let's begin with the table of contents. The contents include one an introduction to the guide to excellence in treasury section 2 preparing to become the treasurer 3 first steps for the new treasurer 4 effective communication 5 securing resources 6 overcoming blind spots 7 building and developing your team 8 metrics 9 approaching technology intentionally 10 taking ownership cash working capital and payment security 11 reference basics of risk management and 12 about the firm's strategic treasurer and ctm file section 1 introduction Welcome to the Guide to Excellence in Treasury, the first ebook in the professional development series. Whether you're aiming to become a treasurer, have just landed the job, or have held the position for years but are still seeking ways to improve and grow, this guidebook should have some ideas that will help you and your organization thrive. This ebook draws heavily from the popular podcast series Becoming a Treasurer from Strategic Treasurer's Treasury Update podcast. For deeper dives on many of these topics and for more ideas that can help you support your organization, we encourage you to listen in. Section 2 Preparing to become the treasurer. Although treasurers come from various backgrounds and there is no single path to treasury, the internet still holds a substantial amount of information about how to become a treasurer. What is harder to find information on and arguably harder to accomplish is becoming an excellent treasurer. The following key elements of broad expertise and mindset lay a strong foundation for anyone seeking to excel in their new or old treasury role the first element is broad expertise there are two types of expertise broad and deep most roles in the financial world require deep expertise or specialization you don't necessarily need to know much about a great variety of things but you need to know 99% of the information that there is to know about your speciality in these types of roles your thinking also tends to be more linear and detailed in accounting for example a reconciliation often is incomplete until it is balanced to the last cent if only because discrepancies indicate flaws in the system this type of expertise is vital to large organizations and can vastly enrich treasurer's understanding of their field and their various departments they interact with that said When one becomes a treasurer deep specialization is not the primary type of expertise needed treasury requires broad expertise and global thinking while other roles focus appropriately on making sure everything is exact on a micro level a treasurer's role is to quantify risks and cash positions at the macro level You need to be able to observe and simultaneously consider many different factors, understanding what's going on in the organization it's in its entirety and quickly summing up situations in order to assess risks, make decisions and appropriately advise the organization's leadership. To do all of this, your understanding must be very broad, even if it is not as deep as it might be in other roles. 
The aspiring treasurer should keep this in mind while looking to garner experience. While larger companies often have very specialized roles and allow you to gain deep experience, which is certainly useful, smaller companies with fewer employees often require each employee to wear multiple hats, which can be helpful in gaining a treasurer's broad understanding. Many treasurers have been through different types of organizations and benefited from both types of experience. Neither is necessarily better, but be aware of which situation you are in. Take advantage of the strengths of your circumstances and seek to balance out the weaknesses. The second element is mindset. Do you consider yourself a vendor to your organization or do you think of yourself as a strategic business partner? Vendors have a limited specific role. They provide certain services, but they are ultimately less concerned with the rest of the organization. They fulfill the obligations, but they do not look further. Strategic business partners, however, are focused not simply on fulfilling their duties, important as that is, they proactively seek to aid others in the organization in accomplishing their goals and in ensuring organizational objectives are met. They focus on building thoughtful communication skills that help them work more effectively and closely with others in the company. This is the path to excellence. To truly become a strategic business partner, however, you must learn about what others do. This is part of the broad expertise issue, as you must understand not only the goals and concerns of your own department, but also the goals and concerns of the organization at large and of various groups within it. This requires both a theoretical knowledge and a working understanding of the business with the latter achieved through getting out in it, touring the plant, seeing the medical facilities operations or whatever it may look like for your particular organization. Once you understand the broader picture, you are better equipped to help. Section 3. First Steps for the New Treasurer How should you begin as a new treasurer? What do you need to do to focus on to make sure you are setting yourself, your department and your organization up for success? Here are several vital areas for the new treasurer to focus on. The first is to use the honeymoon period wisely. When treasurers first step into their position, they have what we call a honeymoon period. What we mean by this is that they have a few months to a year to deal with the problems they have inherited. Whether lax payment security, outdated technology or any major issues before these problems become their own. In order to deal with the skeletons they find in the closet or taking the role, treasurers must perform a three-step process on each one. First, they must assess and take inventory of the situation, making sure they know exactly where the problems lie. Second, they must take a plan, deciding what resources they need and what steps they must take to correct the issue. Third, they must implement that plan and at least begin to take action before the honeymoon period ends, if at all possible. It's easy to make a plan and become satisfied with your good intentions, but good intentions and plans alone won't fix anything. Two areas to assess and reinforce are payment security and treasury's ownership of cash, both of which are covered in detail in the section on taking ownership on page 22 of this ebook. At least starting an assessment of payment security during the honeymoon period is vital so that you can get on to any lingering vulnerabilities before the criminals do. When it comes to owning cash, the new treasurer must be careful to avoid being too timid in positioning treasury as the area responsible for cash. This may take time and many patient conversations. See next chapter for more on this. The second vital area is assess technology. You and your department cannot survive on 15 year old legacy technology no matter how perfectly it served the need when it was first set up. 
Solutions that still work may linger for a while longer, but you need to at least begin planning for when they do need replacement. In your search for new technology, your criteria should include efficiency and open connectivity both externally, for example with banks, and internally, for instance with an ERP system, payment hub, or other technology used by treasury and accounting. For more guidance on treasury technology and how to select the right solution for your organization, please explore our ebooks, analyst reports, podcast episodes, and other resources on the topic at strategictreasurer.com. The third vital area is developed alliances. This concept ties back to the idea of becoming a strategic partner rather than a vendor to your organization. Excellence in treasury requires looking beyond your own role and department to gain a deep understanding of the situation and goals of the departments around you and the entire organization. Once you understand others, you can leverage your own knowledge and skills to help them achieve their goals. Since many of the goals of other departments are important to the organization at large, you protect the organization by helping them and in the process you build alliances. These alliances can prove helpful in many ways, such as when Treasury begins pushing for organization-wide adoption of certain policies, structures or practices. Your allies, having seen firsthand that you truly have their best interests in mind, are likely to be the first adopters. Building on initial successes with your allies, you can gradually bring the rest of the organization around to ideas and practices they would never have considered otherwise, ultimately improving everyone's positions. Section 4. Effective Communication Communication in many ways is the lifeblood of treasury skills. No matter how good you are at identifying risks and finding the best ways to mitigate them, if you can't communicate, there is often very little you can do about it. Even if you can scrape by with mediocre communication skills, you are likely reading or listening to this ebook because just scraping by isn't what you want. You want to excel and excellent treasurers must master excellent communication. To do so, they must become proficient in five areas. First, take the long view. To many of us, the phrase good communication skills may bring to mind friends and family who simply have a way with words. They communicate easily the first time and we don't understand how. Although we doubt we can ever achieve it, we relentlessly believe that if we are to be good communicators, we must magically gain the ability to get through to people quickly and easily. The truth, however, is almost the opposite. Good communication, especially within an organization and in treasury roles, usually means patience and repetition. Many of those whom treasury professionals need to communicate with are from entirely different backgrounds, operate in departments that manage different aspects and have different concerns for the organization and truly have little idea of what treasury does and why it's there. Your job in these cases is to explain it to them in terms that they can understand, keeping in mind this important rarely recognized fact, they are unlikely to fully grasp it the first time. They may be quite intelligent, but with so little context for your point of view and so much on their own mind, it is probable that they won't take it in fully and permanently with just one explanation. Rather than blaming them for this and indulging in frustration, the effective communicator seeks to understand the other party's position and takes care to explain as clearly as possible, carefully using words and lines of reasoning that make sense from the listener's perspective. 
and then the effective communicator keeps explaining again and again. Learning this skill as early as possible will not only ease friction in the aspiring treasurer's life from the start, but it will also prove vital in a position in treasury. Take the long view and keep in mind that communication is a process, not an event. The second area to master is listen, think, ask and talk. This requires humility, but the payoff is something to be proud of. For most of us, it takes conscious effort to prioritize our communication in this way. It can be especially difficult for those of us in treasury and other financial roles as financial professionals tend to be skilled in rapidly grasping the order of magnitude, approximate trends and directional aspects of a situation. We can reach good, reasonable decisions quickly and we feel the need to speak when we do. It's nonetheless vital for us to follow this process of listening, considering and probing before speaking and there are two reasons for this. The first is that we need to ensure that we understand the nuances of the situation, not just the general direction of it and we need to understand everyone else's concerns thoroughly so that we can address them. The second is that others must see what we've taken care to understand People's willingness to listen to your thoughts skyrockets when they feel that their own thoughts have truly been hear, heard and that you see their perspectives and circumstances. Put in the work to understand the goals, challenges and drivers of those in other areas of your organization, both in general and in the context of particular conversation and then let them see that you understand. The third area to master is clarity. Making sure your communication is clear is obviously a crucial component of effective communication. Consider these three areas where a little effort to be extra clear can go a long way. A. Have a clear purpose for your communication. What are you trying to accomplish in this meeting, in this conversation or in this email? You don't have a meeting merely to discuss something, but depending on whether you are in the process, you might have a meeting to decide, to understand, or to understand and then decide. Whatever the purpose, articulate it clearly. B. Passing out an edict versus looking for an input. Many of us have had the awkward experience of receiving input on something we've already decided and didn't really want more opinions on. While it can be tempting to blame others in such situations, it's more helpful to remember that it's on us to be clear about what's going on and what type of communication we intend to receive in return. If you are passing out an edict, so to speak, be sure to explain why the decision was made, but make it clear that the polls are closed. Conversely, if you want input, ask for it and make sure others feel comfortable bringing you their thoughts. C. Speak the same language and define your terms. Cash does not mean the same thing to someone from Treasury as it means to someone from Accounts Receivable or AR. And it's not the only term that is often defined a bit differently from department to department and sometimes even from person to person. Keep an eye out for words like this and pause to make sure you and your colleagues are speaking the same language before you get too deep into a conversation where you might be talking past each other. The fourth area to master is red lines. There are some red lines that when crossed means it's time for a treasurer to perform the difficult juggling act of being very firm while also remaining winsome and friendly. It isn't fun for most of us but it needs to happen and it's easier if you feel confident that the situation calls for a hard conversation and if you know how to go about it. Different scenarios require different types of confrontations. Below are a few things to keep in mind as you assess and approach these situations. 
first. In general, red lines are crossed when we find an individual or group doing things that don't help the company achieve its goals, that demonstrate a narrow focus on the area's priorities while disregarding organizational priorities or that fail to follow key principles. A couple of examples of hills worth dying on, treasury owning cash and payment security. Second, we don't want to be or come across as unreasonable sticklers, so it's important that our position be defensible and that we explain our reasoning. It is equally important, however, that we clarify that these are situations where we are not looking for input. Our attitude and words must convey this is the situation, this is why, and this is what we are going to do. Third, often these conversations will need following up with frameworks and policies. When an area is important enough that it requires hard conversations, it's probably an area where it would be appropriate, helpful, or even necessary to build some frameworks for it. Policies should then flow from those frameworks and procedures from the policies. As always, making sure all relevant parties understand these documents and making sure you and everyone else execute on them consistently are the only ways to prevent your policy making from turning into wasted effort. Fourth, for treasures, sometimes hard conversations come in the slightly different package of issuing a clear warning about certain risks. In some cases, after examining the risks of a situation and making sure you understand them yourself, you may find it sufficient simply to explain what they are and mention how they can be avoided or mitigated. In other cases, if you find it too risky, you may need to issue a very clear warning. In either case, it's vital to explain why it's risky and what exactly the risks are. We tend to think of this risk assessment and warning function of Treasury as primarily related to an advisory capacity when an area is planning something new, acquiring something new, etc. At times, however, a warning may also be appropriate when you see activities or trends currently in action that are unsustainable and that threaten the organization's health or reputation. The fifth area treasurers must master is sharing other successes. Fortunately, not all communication in treasury is about the red lines and the hard talks. Just as essential is our need to encourage, support and uphold others and their successes. While most of the communication skills we've discussed are more focused, this element of communication is more subtle and far-reaching in its effect. When those around us, whether in treasury or in other parts of the organization, think outside their silos, reach across departments and create success not only for themselves or their areas, but for the organization at large that deserves to be supported and shared. Even in politically charged organizations, applauding behavior that achieves organizational success can encourage more people to move in the right direction. A treasurer who can champion organizational health in this way master the juggling act of winsomely challenging red lines, send clear signals and send them as often as needed, and listen, think, and ask people before responding can become an immensely powerful vessel of positive change in an organization. Much as that may seem a long list to balance, each element feeds into the others and forming alliances and strong relationships using these skills makes communication moving forward all the smoother. These smooth lines of communication can then pave a much more actionable path for everything else the treasurer seeks to accomplish. Section 5. Securing Resources As Treasury's influence and responsibilities grow, additional resources are needed to support the heavier expectations placed on the department. These resources can come in various forms – people, skills, technology, and even access to data and plans. 
Securing resources can be challenging, but it is also key to properly supporting your organization's growth. In this section, we'll cover some general principles that can help you as treasurer secure the resources you need as well as guidance on specific type of resources you may require. Let's start with the general principles for securing resources. Most resources you will need in treasury require funding and funding is difficult to obtain. The gatekeepers of that funding like treasury are guardians of an area of corporate assets. They are tasked with ensuring that only projects and resources that are meaningfully beneficial to the organization receive funding. This means that the best way to obtain buy-ins, to identify and clearly communicate how the resources you need will benefit the organization and its goals as a whole. There are a couple of important elements to communicate here. First, strategic benefit. Companies have specific goals and missions from capable management and efficiency to risk and compliance. As an excellent treasurer and strategic partner to your company, you should be deeply aware of these goals. Your conversations and attention to other areas of the company should have given you a good sense of overarching needs and your chosen resources should be aimed at addressing those needs and goals. In presenting your case for a certain resource, build a strong foundation for your argument by demonstrating the compelling need in terms of organizational missions and show how your requested resource empowers the company to meet its goals. The second important element is financial benefit. Showing a return on investment or ROI is a classic way of demonstrating to the company that funding your project is a reasonable financial move for them. The ROI is expected, can help your argument and should not be neglected. However, many miss the point of an ROI and expect it to stand out as the sole necessary reason for a resource. Remember that the strategic argument is what demonstrates the need for the resource. The ROI should be used simply to show that your chosen resource is the best way of addressing that need. One additional consideration to keep in mind as you make your case for various resources is this. Never promise more than you can deliver. Keep in mind your long-term goals. You want to obtain a certain resource now, yes. But as time goes by, you also want to build a strong track record with the company. If the company sees that your resources perform as you said they would and that you use funding well, that track record will make it easier to obtain more resources in the future. Moving forward, the next general principle for securing resources is connected with people. Treasury is a thinly staffed department as a rule, and it tends to grow far more slowly than its responsibilities do. With some expectation of being stretched thin, some may wait until the department is completely swamped and the problem is obvious before seeking to add staff. This is not necessary and can create problems, however, as soon as you can clearly identify what is lacking and what is required, you should link this to the organization's goals and missions and seek the resource. Beware, however, of assuming that simply adding more people is the best way to solve the problem. Wherever it makes sense, leverage automation or outsourcing to free staff up for more strategic activities than those that add value. You might even discover that some tasks can simply be removed through more efficient processes. Even if staff are the answer, simply adding more people is not the best way to approach the issue. Instead, think in terms of increasing the skill set available. Often this will mean hiring someone with a careful eye to getting the skills you most need. Sometimes it might mean using training to add skills to the staff you already have. The third principle you may like to bear in mind is access. While not often thought of as a resource, access to things such as data, plans and people can be vital for treasury and this access functions well when treated as a resource. 
There is less of a specified process for gaining these access related resources, but approach it as makes sense in your organization. Consider what you need and familiarize yourself with the proper channels for gaining it at your company. Section 6 Overcoming Blind Spots Everyone has areas of insight and areas where their perspective is lacking something. These blind spots amount to weaknesses and can often result in consistent oversights and mistakes. This can be problematic no matter what your role is, but for treasurers, unchecked blind spots can spell disaster for the entire organization. Overcoming blind spots should be an area of intentional ongoing effort for treasurers. This means recognizing strengths and weaknesses, leveraging the strengths and balancing out the weaknesses both on your team and in your skill set. Recognizing strengths and weaknesses. People have difficulty seeing themselves clearly and blind spots are especially difficult to find out when you have only your own perspectives to rely on. External feedback is crucial for identifying strengths and weaknesses and rooting out blind spots. To do so, the first thing Treasury should do is to avoid the echo chamber. This requires going against the dictates of comfort as you build your team, valuing diverse perspectives and avoiding the temptation to build an echo chamber. Many treasurers when considering candidates for a position are drawn to those with similar backgrounds and similar skill sets to their own. Treasury professionals come from a variety of backgrounds and it's easy to assume that your path, which probably had many merits, is the best path and that those from different backgrounds could not do as well or would not be able to work well alongside you. Although hiring staff with similar backgrounds and skill sets as your own is intended to surround you with excellent professionals and gather team members who are all on the same page, it actually tends to construct an echo chamber and impair depth perception. Team members ought to counteract one another's blind spots but the echo chamber only reinforces them and makes them harder to detect. To avoid this, treasurers should intentionally seek to surround themselves with a team whose backgrounds, experiences and perspectives vary. Certainly, team members need to work well together and should all be oriented towards organizational and departmental priorities, but it's vital to have those whose perspectives allow them to spot your blind spots, question the status quo and suggest alternative routes. The second thing treasurers ought to do is to be open to receiving feedback. Having successfully avoided an echo chamber and surrounded yourself with varying perspectives, the next challenge is to listen when people bring ideas that differ from your own. This does not mean that every suggestion must be taken, but it does mean that the opinion of others, whether on your team or on another, should be sincerely considered. This includes both opinion about the right course of action and opinions about you. While some personalities may be inclined to offer their opinions and critiques unsolicited, keep in mind that if you really want to excel in your role as treasurer, you will need to actively seek out feedback. This can be uncomfortable and at times the feedback one receives is inapplicable. Often, it is wise to refrain from fully responding to feedback, especially personal feedback, in the moment. Instead, take some time to think it through and perhaps begin working on the issue that was brought to your attention before deciding whether the feedback was accurate or not. Treasurers should also consider indirect feedback, which may appear in the form of your efforts going awry and your communication being misunderstood. When someone on your staff, for example, fails to comprehend something you told them, resist the urge to blame them. Rather, consider why they might not have understood you in terms of your own communication. Use misunderstandings as opportunities to learn and improve your own communication. 
The third aspect you as a treasurer should focus on is balancing your strengths and weaknesses. Identifying your strengths can be helpful as it can allow you to leverage them more effectively. However, caution is needed to avoid boxing yourself in or telling yourself that your strengths are all you can do. Similarly, identifying your weaknesses should not be used simply to avoid putting yourself in positions that demand skills you lack. The goal is to incrementally move into a more balanced position. For example, introverts are skilled at thinking things through on their own. They should leverage this skill to best effect, but they should also step out of their comfort zone from time to time and challenge themselves with more extroverted tasks. Similarly, extroverts should balance leveraging their strengths with pushing themselves to perform some introverted tasks at times. As the feedback you receive and your own self-reflection show you areas of weakness, consider ways you can challenge yourself and build up strength in those weaker areas. This typically cannot be accomplished all at once. However, aim for ways to improve over time. Section 7 Building and Developing Your Team Everyone has blind spots and weaknesses and wise treasurers will surround themselves with strong teams that can fill the gaps and accomplish what one person alone never could. Each team member you add and each decision you make regarding the development of those team members, regardless of whether that decision is made consciously or by default, will shift the culture and influence the mindset of your department. Since mindsets tend to spiral and reverberate among staff, each staffing and team management choice gives the treasurer an opportunity to set up chain reactions of strategic thinking, proper mindset and forward thinking excellence that will propel both the department and the organization toward success. The first component in this chapter is building your team. While some treasurers might have the opportunity to walk into a fresh department and build a team from scratch, most are likely to build their team a bit more piecemeal. Putting new team members in place only in the normal course of staff turnover and replacement. In either case, treasurers will need to know how to strategically place the right people into the right roles. There are two primary elements that must be understood in order to put together the right team for your organization's needs. Perhaps the most obvious element regards skill sets and understanding what skills you need to look for, but the other element, mindset, is prerequisite to that. Before you can accurately assess your department's skill needs and find the right person for a role, you will need to take a high level view of the type of team you need to form and make sure you're guarding yourself against common blind spots. Approaching building the team. The first of these high level assessments involves considering the type and size of your organization and recognizing that your treasury team may need to look like others you've seen. Larger firms tend to have larger treasury departments. With more staff and higher volumes of each task come deeper specialization. More thinly staffed, smaller departments require more flexible players on the team as they often have to juggle multiple responsibilities and wear several hats. In addition to the size consideration, different types of organizations have different requirements. A treasury team supporting a global organization with a high volume of cross-border transactions will be composed of a different skill set than the treasury department of a domestic organization. For example, almost every organization has its own areas of intensity that will determine the skill set required of its staff. This leads into the second high-level concept, adaptability of the team versus puzzle piece mentality. The adaptability approach seeks people who are flexible enough to move from role to role as needed, whereas the puzzle piece approach focuses on putting together a team with complementary skills, each team member being a perfect fit for their role. Both methods have been used to good effect in different treasury departments. 
Often, the best choice may be a combination, finding a few specialists and a few solid adaptable players. As mentioned in the previous chapter, it is also vital to avoid the mindset that leads to creating an echo chamber. Your own experiences, opinions and route to treasury have likely given you many strengths but they may have left you with a handful of weaknesses too. To balance out those weaknesses, you need people on your team who come from different backgrounds and perspectives and can offer alternative opinions. Approach your team building efforts with the mindset to find people who work well together while bringing a variety of strengths to the table, not just your favorite strengths. What to look for? With the proper mindset in place, let's move on to specific categories of skill to consider in building out your team. The first category is finding the technical skills you need. There is no magic formula of technical skills you need on your team. The skills that are important for your team will be unique and dependent on many factors including your firm's size, industry, global position and so on. You might need staff with specialization in particular elements of risk such as foreign exchange or commodities. You might need employed skills in operational efficiency or payments. It all depends on your organizational needs. Identify your where your organization is intensive and make sure you build a team that is similarly intensive in that area, perhaps with flexible players to fill in the less intensive but still important gaps. The second category to consider is technology skills. Technology has been crucial to treasury for some time, but it now seems to have been integrated into every aspect of treasury and the development of technology has arguably never been so rapid. In such an environment, the treasury department desperately needs workers who can understand and help pilot new technology. This skill set is crucial enough that at times it may rightly prove a determining factor in who gets the job. Next is mindset. This category of skills is rather broad and might be more accurately called a category of character. But regardless, the value of staff who possess these qualities cannot be overstated. Ideally, every team member in treasury would either be described by these traits or would be working to develop them. First, be open to new ideas and open to communicating. This doesn't mean always chasing the shiny new object, however. People with this skill have developed the discernment to differentiate between buzzwords and the new technologies, structures and actions that can matter. Second, be agents of change, helping to leapfrog the organization from decade to decade as technology and processes progress. This is in many ways, the next step after being open to new ideas. Agents of change take the beneficial change they find, again differentiating this beneficial change from the buzzwords and help their organization recognize, adopt and make the best use of it. Third, become efficiency experts. There are always costs to drive out and there are almost always improvements to be made in efficiency. Since protecting the assets of an organization is treasury's duty, driving costs out by increasing efficiency is something that should be on every treasury professional's mind. Fourth, become continual learners, taking every opportunity to understand concepts more fully or to learn about different ways of accomplishing tasks. Fifth, develop a risk mindset. Every member of a treasury department ought to have some level of risk mindset. The particular direction this takes will vary from role to role, but the question, how do I de-risk this, should be a habit of thought for every treasury professional. The next segment in this section is developing the team. Finding the right staff is just the first step. Now you must also manage and develop your team, helping them grow and excel. Much could be written on this topic, but we will focus on two main goals, challenging your people and promoting a positive mindset toward technology. First, challenging people. People grow when challenged. For some, the occasional moderate challenge is enough to keep them growing and invested, and more might stress or overwhelm them. 
Other personalities need more rigorous and frequent challenges as they lose interest otherwise. The following are three ways of providing your staff with challenges, but keep in mind the need to know your staff and adjust your approach to match each person's style. A. Projects with deadlines. Giving people a project to work on and a deadline to have it finished by can help them step up, take responsibility, innovate and grow. The project can be your idea, a corporate initiative or the employee's own idea. Some organizations approach this with a three-month cadence, with each staff member completing some project every quarter. Others assign projects as they come up. However you choose to do it though, remember that deadlines are only meaningful and helpful if you check up on them and hold your staff to them. B. Learning Goals We want our staff going to conferences, reading, listening to podcasts and doing anything else that challenges them to continue deepening or broadening their expertise and understanding. To encourage this and set more definitive goals, have your employees bring back points to share with their teammates. Whether summarizing the main points of a conference or discussing how something heard on a podcast relates to the department, this process of consolidating and recounting the information helps both the speaker and the listeners. C. Experimenting and piloting Challenge your employees by putting them in charge of experimenting with new technology or other initiatives that might prove useful to your group. Give them low stakes piloting projects where they can experiment, fail, learn from their mistakes, try again and ultimately build a wealth of expertise and experience. This can be combined with the project deadline challenge mentioned above. The second primary goal in developing the treasury team is people versus technology. It is not a zero sum game. Many in treasury as well as in other industries are afraid of being replaced by technology. This is understandable and it cannot be denied that some roles are becoming less and less available as technology fills gaps that people used to. However, the ultimate goal of technology use in treasury is not to replace people but to empower them to do what only they can. Rather than fearing technology, encourage your staff to develop higher level strategic skills as well as technology skills. With skill sets that leverage technology under their belts, your staff can be ready to support and benefit from new technology instead of seeing it as something to be resisted. Section 8. Metrics Treasurers need to measure various elements of their business to know what's happening and what needs to change, but it can be overwhelming trying to decide where to start, what to measure, and how to measure it all. Besides, with limited resources, treasurers must be focused and efficient in their measurements. Below are five of the most crucial categories to measure. We'll then go over a few vital things to keep in mind, implement or avoid to make your measurement process successful from beginning to end. Areas of focus in metrics. First, operational activities. It is important to know how you are doing on the things you do the most. Not only do the insights and opportunities for improvement from measuring operations prove well worth the resources invested, but the area also lends itself to being measured as it has a number of quantifiable activities. Examples of measurements within this category include number of wire transfers, payments volume, the speed and efficiency with which you procure services and the price you pay for those services. Second, liquidity. Liquidity can and should be measured from multiple different angles, especially your access to liquidity and the diversification of your sources for liquidity. Thinking more broadly, this can also relate to measuring forecasting accuracy and variance analysis. Third, risk. Risk as a key area for measurement should come as no surprise. Tracking metrics in this area usually means measuring financial risk, but as with liquidity, think more broadly and see if there are some less obvious measurements that could be key indicators in your organization. Fourth, security. 
Many organizations neglect the measurement of security, but in our current environment of elevated fraud risks, security deserves a seat amongst our top priorities. Metrics in security are often somewhat more abstract, but find the best ways to measure whether your organization is staying current, whether you are staying ahead of criminals, and whether you are staying ahead of your peers. It's important to know whether you linger at the back of the pack in this area as being behind in your overall security stance makes you both more likely to be targeted. Companies with poor defenses are seen as easier targets and more likely to incur actual losses through those attacks. Third party security assessments or benchmarking against similar companies may be useful for many in gathering and understanding their security metrics. Fifth, projects. Measuring how you manage projects can prove immensely useful in making sure your efforts to make improvements won't go to waste. Whatever the type of projects, gathering data and tracking your progress in this area can help ensure you keep moving the needle and do consistency across the organization. How to measure. Knowing what to measure only does us good if we also know how to measure it, what to compare against and what to do with those measurements once we have them. Here are a few tips to help you get started. Internal versus external comparison. The full spectrum of comparisons you measure against can be bisected into internal and external. Both types are useful, but companies should be careful to use each in the right way. Internal comparisons allow you to see change over time and give you a very apples to apples comparison, but they do not show you how your company stacks up in the broader environment. However, external comparisons can be treacherous as it can be difficult to find an external comparison where all other factors are equal. Comparing apples to oranges gets you nowhere and while much can be gained, if you are able to measure yourself accurately against your industry, attempting to compare yourself to organizations with too many different circumstances and different factors at play will only waste your efforts and result in faulty conclusions. If you engage a third party for benchmarking, ensure that the party you select compares your company to those similar to it, not just to any company on which they have data. The second tip on how to measure is standards. Measurements often involve pitting yourself against a standard. Standards can act as positional targets, giving your organization a level to shoot for and assess yourself against. The terminology surrounding corporate standards is ironically not standardized, but we at Strategic Treasurer have found the following hierarchy helpful. First, world class. The best of the best. This standard indicates the pinnacle of practice for the relevant area and industry. Very few organizations attain to this highest standard. Second, leading practice. Not world class, but excellent and very worthy of emulation. This standard puts you in good company and above what is commercially reasonable. Third, standard of good corporate conduct. This standard is the minimum acceptable level for an organization. It meets but does not exceed expectations. One danger to note with this standard is that it is likely to shift as time goes by. Security standards tend to rise rapidly, for example, as do efficiency standards. So if this is your level, you need to watch carefully lest you fall below acceptable positions when standards rise. Think of this level as merely commercially reasonable practices. The next tip on how to measure is timing. Measurement doesn't function as well as a separate process. If we expect it to be separate and wait for some staff member to have several hours to devote to the measuring process, we can be fairly certain it will never happen. Instead, measurements need to be built in so that they happen systematically and regularly. The timing can vary from organization to organization and from measurement to measurement. 
Some things need to be measured annually, quarterly, monthly, weekly or daily and different organizations already have certain cadences that work well for them. Whatever the rhythm, however, it is important that the timing be formalized. The last tip is communication. Often other departments need to see the measurements we take, but as we discussed in an earlier section, those from other backgrounds and groups frequently don't understand much of what Treasury does. After taking measurements, an excellent treasurer must ensure that any other parties involved understand the data's context and meaning. Again, it is crucial to consider the background of your audience and explain information as many times as necessary in terms they will understand. What gets measured gets managed as long as it is seen, understood and linked to corporate goals. If we want to keep all our efforts in finding appropriate comparisons and integrating measurements into our processes from going to waste, we can't let the process stop with collecting the data. Distribute it to those who need to see it. Make it understood to them. Make sure neither they nor you ignore the data and then you can again begin reaping the benefits of well-measured processes. Section 9. Approaching Technology Intentionally The modern treasury department runs on technology. New innovations frequently lead to changes in how treasury accomplishes its purpose and occasionally lead to adjustments in treasury's responsibilities. Treasurers are not IT staff and they do not need a highly detailed or technical understanding of technology but they absolutely must develop and maintain a deep comprehension of key principles, uses and trends. What is the technology available? What matters? And what's on the horizon? How does it apply to your organization's current state and future goals and what can you do about it? Let's start with building and maintaining your knowledge. Those who are on their way to becoming treasurers should recognize that their careers will, without doubt, involve technology projects. If you do not currently have a solid baseline knowledge of technologies impacting treasury, you will need to be deliberate in getting yourself up to speed. Even after you studied technology thoroughly, an intentional approach will still be needed to remain aware and current. The technology landscape changes rapidly and staying abreast of the relevant innovations requires a strong foundation and ongoing work. Finding the right resources that give you relevant information is vital and sometimes challenging. With excitement and advertising always inflating the importance of some types of emerging technologies while others fly under the radar, treasurers should work to develop the discernment to tell which buzzwords matter, which do not, and what resources can help them to distinguish between the two. In choosing your resources, feel free to cater to your own preference in format and media type, whether listening, reading, watching, or engaging in person. Whatever the format, however, make sure that the resources helps you gather the information you need without too many of the technical details you do not need. Browse strategictreasurer.com and ctmfile.com for podcasts, articles, ebooks, analyst reports, webinars, survey reports, and more to help keep you current. We recommend that treasurers take an educational content on technology for several hours each month and potentially even each week. Those currently on the road to treasury may need to dive especially deep to build a strong technological foundation. Next, treasurers should gain facility with tools. While time spent studying resources will help you gain a theoretical knowledge of technology, practical experiences and exploration can help you discover how to apply that theoretical knowledge effectively. As you learn about technologies and their uses in treasury, begin building on that understanding and developing facility with the tools through practical application within your context. At the outset, these projects should be small. 
play with their technologies in low stake scenarios before trying to roll out a serious project where mistakes will have consequences there are many options to explore and which ones you choose should be directed by a deliberate idea of how technology will fit into your specific career While all treasuries in the modern era should approach technology intentionally and build a strong and broad understanding of the technology impacting treasury the specific areas you focus on and the skills you develop can be individualized write a specific plan for what your goals are and how you plan to educate yourself your plan should consider the following questions what positions do you want to be in do you want to be conversant in technology or an expert do you want to be the one always piloting the use of various tools or do you want to have a broad understanding but be less in the weeds of it yourself most of the time how long do you expect to be in treasury and what can you guess about how technology might progress in that time what skills might you need to have mastered by the time you finish your career How do you prefer to learn about technology and how much time do you think you should spend on it? Section 10 Taking ownership Cash, working capital and payment security Cash, working capital and payment security are all areas in which the treasurer has a high level of responsibility for something that other units are heavily involved in. Treasurers can take a variety of stances in these areas ranging from neglecting responsibility to overstepping their bounds. Expanding on a concept first proposed by Maria Delisandro, Craig Jeffries' book The Strategic Treasurer: A Partnership for Corporate Growth defines five distinct stances: oblivious, observer, overseer, owner, and oppressor. The oblivious treasurer makes no effort to take responsibility. Observers take a passive and reactive posture watching what happens and potentially reacting to it, but they are not remotely in control. Overseers are a step up. Not only watching what happens but also making suggestions to improve the situation. To jump to the last posture, the oppressor oversteps the appropriate bounds of their rule and tries to control the area too rigidly with little to no regard for the perspectives of the other departments or groups involved ownership which falls between overseer and oppressor on the continuum is the proper stance for treasury when it comes to cash working capital and payment security taking ownership means taking full responsibility for the area It requires making sure you have a full understanding of what's happening, that the proper measures are in place, and that those responsible for carrying those measures out are doing so. Let's review the first component, cash. While different groups in finance define cash differently, what we mean by the term here is the control of bank accounts and signers, cash in bank accounts and short-term investments. and short term borrowings according to the book the strategic treasurer a partnership for corporate growth by craig jeffrey when there's a problem with this cash the organization's leaders look immediately to treasury faults may eventually be traced back to others but treasury is expected to give an explanation of what went wrong and typically what is to be done about it as well Clearly organizational leadership sees treasury as responsible for cash so the treasurer will do well to take ownership of cash from the start while owning corporate cash does not mean that everything must be centralized it does mean that the organization shouldn't have 20 people all making the decisions about where to move funds and who can open accounts a few specific areas where this ownership is particularly important are bank relationships bank account management managing the debt and equity structure and global risk all of these areas tend to be broken out among multiple departments and multiple decision makers and each party understandably tries to optimize the area for its own department or group ultimately however when each party attempts to optimize for the individual business unit or region the results are suboptimal at the micro level of the organization 
Owning cash does not mean overly leveraging control of this asset to force other actions or behaviors. For example, it doesn't mean dismissing the needs of others in the organization just to make sure you get the yield you want on the invested cash, nor does it mean maintaining an iron grip on payment terms without concern for vendors being too stingy to allow appropriate inventory or suggesting that everyone pay collect on deposit. These would characterize the oppressor in our schema above. Rather, owning cash means ensuring that your stance is sufficiently strong to support what the company needs from you. It is necessary for Treasury to own cash in order to properly protect it and the company as a whole will run more smoothly and securely with Treasurer in the proper role. Properly owning cash means accepting the responsibility for it, ensuring that you have the ability to do whatever is necessary to protect it, remaining engaged and having a plan to know what needs to be done in various situations. Properly owning cash requires Treasury to take responsibility for the company's financial account policy, bank reconciliation and Treasury reconciliation, also called Treasury proof, visibility requirements, performance metrics and cash recording. The Treasurer will need to cooperate with accounting and other groups in many of these areas but the Treasury Department's position must be well thought out and while highly considerate of the needs and opinions of others, uncompromising in these areas. The second component is working capital. Another area the Treasury must take ownership of is working capital. Keep in mind that in Treasury, working capital typically refers to net adjusted working capital which is accounts receivable plus inventory minus accounts payable. Not the traditional definition of current assets minus current liabilities typically used by accounting. Both definitions are useful but the net adjusted definition shows a summary of what's occurring with the components of the cash conversion cycle which is something Treasury has a responsibility to attend to. This type of working capital impacts organizational value and its management or mismanagement leads to chain reactions across the company. As careful oversight and leadership in this area can result in significant improvements for both departments and the organization at large, no highly excellent company neglects working capital management. Still, why does its management fall to treasury? Several areas such as accounts payable, and accounts receivable are directly involved in working capital but Treasury has little to no direct involvement. However, working capital management requires a broad perspective that takes into account quite a number of different factors and is able to remain focused on the bigger picture. Treasury's broad view of the company's situation, goals and needs makes it the department ideally suited to taking responsibility for optimizing working capital. In addition, its wide-ranging impacts on the company's assets, profitability and valuation mean that Treasury is not only in the ideal position to take ownership of working capital but also has a responsibility to do so. The excellent Treasurer must take ownership of working capital by focusing on optimizing it, not minimizing or maximizing and leading the various areas involved through a process of identifying the right goals and working together towards them. If your company does not already have a working capital council, Treasury should start one. These councils bring together representatives from each area involved in the components of working capital with three different areas in the formula itself AR, inventory and AP and many more that either impact or are impacted by it, working capital is a complex area. Managing it requires a significant amount of teamwork among groups that are typically plagued by competing key performance indicators or KPIs. As long as competing KPIs are present, working capital will not be optimized. The first step then is to bring these units together in a working capital council and start working towards a united front with common ultimate goals. Treasury should lead the council and ensure the following. First, make sure all parties are heard and understood. 
Each group has a different perspective and it may take work to reach a point where each member is cognizant of the perspectives of each of the other members. In addition to ensuring that the council participants come to a good understanding of each other's perspectives, Treasury should make sure that those impacted but not present are considered by the council. This includes both internal business units and customers and external partners. Many working capital initiatives can impact vendors, for example, and this impact should be taken into account in the Council's discussions. Second, establish a single set of KPIs. Identify competing KPIs and thoroughly eliminate them. In their place, work with the Council to establish a single set of agreed-upon KPIs that support each group's needs and help each group support organizational goals. Third, Agree on objectives of working capital initiatives. With the groundwork above laid, the Council can get down to the business of managing working capital directly. This may involve deciding on working capital initiatives, and these initiatives can be given their own specific objectives. Like the new KPIs, these objectives can help clarify the ultimate goal of the initiative, preventing overly narrow or misdirected efforts. Fourth. Reassess and adjust as needed. Despite the Council's best efforts, you may not get everything just right the first time and new problems may crop up with new KPIs or working capital initiatives. Even if not, changing circumstances may require adjustment. With the Council, assess progress, monitor impacts and readjust as you find areas that are not benefiting or where something could be improved. Keep working with your council to bring your working capital to optimal levels for balancing departmental needs and organizational value. The third component in taking ownership is payment security. For many in Treasury or learning about Treasury, security may sound like someone else's responsibility. Your company may have a chief information security officer and an entire IT department. Isn't ensuring security their job? Much of security is, but as a superintendent of payments, the treasurer does have a certain responsibility when it comes to payment security. With an overall responsibility to protect the organization's most liquid assets, treasury cannot ignore a risk to cash, not to mention a risk to organizational reputation, as significant and rapidly growing as payment fraud. As a superintendent may not teach the classes or clean the building, Treasury may perform few of the tasks involved in payment security. Also like a superintendent, however, tre the treasurer is responsible for ensuring that those tasks are being carried out properly. Boards are coming to expect this and increasingly holding Treasury responsible for payment security. While there are some treasurers who fall into the ditch of overreaching by trying to wrench the actual tasks of payment security out of the hands of those who ought to be performing them or by trying to take full charge of all security, the, co the more common ditch is that of taking an overly passive role. Take ownership, develop a strong awareness of what is happening with payment security and fraud both within your company and in the environment at large and take the necessary steps to shore up vulnerable areas. Consider the following areas as you seek to grow in your role as superintendent of payment security. First, staying current. As with technological awareness, security and fraud awareness is not a one and done deal. Criminals are constantly improving their methods and responding to improved security with more sophisticated and automated attacks. Security recommendations in response must also continually evolve, meaning that staying aware of the payment fraud risks and security environment requires ongoing study and attention. Some measures that would be deemed extreme now will be standard practice within a couple of years and some may be added to the requirements of various networks or insurance policies that might apply to your company. Second, know your accounts and your payment flows. In addition to maintaining awareness, the treasurer is responsible for the security measures involved in bank account management, including maintaining thorough visibility to all accounts. Treasury should also have a full inventory of payment flows. 
While many organizations think they know the approximate number of payment flows they have, they usually discover that there are many more than they realized when they formally inventory them. Each flow and each account needs to be protected appropriately and you cannot protect what you do not know exists or what you cannot see. Third, layers. Approach your organizational payment security with the goals of having multiple layers of security everywhere that a criminal could possibly make headway. This includes having account and transaction level controls in place, having security systems and system enforced controls wherever needed, and also strengthening the human element. Fourth, training. No matter how secure your systems are, your company is still only as secure as your staff make it. People can be either a severe vulnerability or they can become a strong layer of defense for the company. The difference is largely a matter of training and attitude. All staff members who handle payments should see themselves as defenders. Keep in mind that training should occur annually, not just at the point of hire for all employees involved in payment processes and should address both IT security and payment security. Annual payment security training has been shown to correlate to lower rates of fraud loss to certain types of attack, according to the Strategic Treasurer's 2020 Treasury Fraud and Control Survey results. These are just a few of the steps the Treasurer should be taking or overseeing in the role of Superintendent of Payment Security. On the whole, be skeptical and approach your security with the creative eye of someone looking for vulnerabilities. Picture yourself being asked by the board after a loss why some exposure had not been identified and fixed. You can take some care to find the most effective manner of putting security measures in place, but if you need to do something, find a way to do it. Benchmarking and third-party assessments could also be conducted periodically to help you identify and weed out blind spots. These can also be helpful for new treasurers trying to get their bearings and to quickly bring payment security up to speed. For a more comprehensive framework and leading practices for payment security and treasury's role in it, check out our other ebooks and our security roadmap with its free 8-question security assessment. Section 11 References Basics of Risk Management What follows are brief discussions of several basic concepts and principles of risk management. These are not comprehensive essays on each topic but a collection of compact information and wisdom for reference. Risk Management this is the process of bringing your exposure into line with your risk appetite and into the realm of what you are capable of accepting as a loss. Hedging is one way of doing this. Risk measurements. The three constituents of risk measurement are risk capacity, risk appetite and risk tolerance. Risk capacity is defined as the maximum level of loss your organization can support. Risk appetite is the stated level of loss your organization is willing to live with and risk tolerance is the practical level of loss where people actually become uncomfortable. Basic Risk Management Principles First, Diversification Spreading your exposure out to avoid having all your investments with one counterparty, industry, etc. Second, Framework to Policy Risk management should begin with a broader framework that looks across all the exposures and considers the company's overall approach to risk. What matters to the organization? What are the exposures in terms of large categories? How does the company want these risks reported on and calibrated, generally speaking? This framework should then flow down into specific policies that detail the what, the when, and the where. While fundamental, this principle is not always put into practice. As most companies focus on having detailed policies but often fail to begin with a solid framework. We recommend that frameworks be reviewed annually, although they may not require changes each time. Third, expect the unexpected. While it is worthwhile to keep track of which outcomes are most likely, 
the expected value, it's also important to keep an eye on the entire range of outcomes. Every now and then, an extreme and unexpected value will occur and failing to prepare for these can cause you to lose money or to lose your business. While it cannot be predicted what the next black swan will be, you can predict that at some point another will appear. Do what you can to prepare. Fourth, don't cheer for your hedges. Since your underlying exposure is larger than your hedge, you generally prefer that it make money than that your hedge make money. The hedge is there to bring your exposure in line with your risk appetite. It's not about making money or speculating. It's about mitigating risk. It may take a fair amount of patience and ongoing work to communicate this idea to others in your organization. Fifth, keep an ear to the ground. Treasurers must learn to balance their attention to the overall noise and movements of the industry and environment at large. It's important not to simply live by what everyone else is doing and saying, but it's also important to avoid dismissing it entirely. Maintain a strong informal network to help fill in your understanding of the larger situations and consider what you are seeing and hearing carefully before moving either with or against the flow. Sixth, know your company. In addition to your theoretical and general understanding of risks, you will need to think specifically and somewhat creatively about the risks to your particular company. Your industry, location, liquidity situation, counterparties and many more issues all play into your risks. What does or would impact your organization? Calibrate these exposures and identify the biggest issues. Pay attention to data, sentiment and actions. Seventh, know yourself and your situations. At some point in your treasury career, and most likely at many points, things will change abruptly. Are you ready to respond? What would slow you? What would make you more nimble? What would enable you to detect things more rapidly? Thank you for your time. To download this ebook, The Guide to Excellence in Treasury, please go to strategictreasurer.com slash guide. Thank you.